Hello and a very warm welcome to Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is an entrepreneur and philanthropist. He's very successful and very outspoken. And here he is, Peter Kramer. Thank you very, very much for joining us today on Talking It's Germany. It's a big pleasure for me. A pleasure for me too. Now, uh, Peter Kramer is a multi-millionaire, no less, having made his fortune as a shipping magnate in Germany's uh, northern port city of Hamburg. I suppose you could say that his message is making money is one matter, but what you do with it is perhaps the more interesting question. <laughs> Peter Kramer, you make your money in shipping. Tell us a little bit about shipping today. Shipping today differs entirely from shipping two years ago. You know, we had wonderful years from 2002, 2003 until 2008, and then the Lehman uh, Brothers uh, crisis came, and the world has changed then entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, the markets, the freight markets collapsed, collapsed really, from 60 to 80,000 US dollar a day, You, in uh, August 2008, mm -hmm. uh, you earned in uh, November 2000 you, US dollar a day. So you made a minus on the ship operating cost, just on the ship operating cost, I'm not talking about capital cost, of 3,000 US dollar a day. Today, fortunately, uh, this ship makes money, but it is the only um, vessel of my fleet who's making money. The majority of my fleet are um, so-called uh, product carriers where transport refurbishment find um, oil products and they are all making losses. Okay, right so the, the, the financial crisis took your fleet into stormy seas. In When, stormy seas. Uh, yes. I mean, the German economy at the moment is picking up. That's what we're hearing. The, the economy is doing very well, impressive growth rates. When is your fleet going to move out of those stormy seas? When's it going to be plain sailing again? I think again? it is uh, a question mark where uh, you get from all experts different answers because, uh, in fact, nobody knows really when. Uh, one analyst, Paul Slater, is talking about a black decade, and if he's saying this, mm -hmm. he's really then pronouncing it black decade, so you are thinking of 10 bad years. Mm -hmm. I'm not thinking of 10 bad years, but it will be a crisis uh, which will take uh, three to four, five years minimum. Okay. Then yeah. I think so. Okay, thank you for that. We've got some first impressions there about Peter Kramer and his business and where it stands at the moment. Let's have a little bit of a look now at his background and especially about his commitment to uh, Africa. 2,867,908. Peter Kramer knows all about making money. And he knows how to reinvest it sensibly and profitably. For example, in education. Using his own money and more from donations, the Hamburg shipping company owner is building 5,000 schools in Africa in cooperation with UNICEF. The first are already finished, and Peter Kramer's been to inspect them. He took the unusual step of matching every euro donated to the project with a euro of his own money. The initiative will provide schooling to about one million children one of the biggest privately financed education projects in the world. Kramer can afford to be generous. His liquid petroleum, gas and oil tankers ply their trade across the globe. The fact that his ships sail under flags of convenience, that is, are registered in foreign countries, has provoked criticism. He says that's necessary to maintain competitiveness. He sees himself as left-wing and named his ships after resistance fighters. He certainly didn't inherit his rebelliousness. His father was an old-school conservative patriarch. Peter grew up as one of four children. He was shy and stuttered and felt closer to his mother. But his father taught him to fight for his aims. That's what he did as an organizer of student protests. But he still passed his law exams. After the early death of his elder brother, he had to take over the shipping company sooner than planned. Peter Kremer feels most comfortable in his Hamburg office, but he has to leave it quite often. For example, to attend fundraising events. He says rich people should take on a greater burden, so he asks them to donate to good causes. He still wants to change things. Ownership comes with responsibilities, he says, And today, he's our guest on Talking Germany, Peter Kremer.
OK, Peter Kramer, I think after listening to that report, there are two things we need to talk about. One is you and one is your project in Africa. Let's begin with you, because it's very interesting in that report. We hear that you are, you are a rebel. Yeah? You're viewed as a rebel. Are you comfortable with that? Well, <laughs> yes, I think so. I think so. I'm, uh, you know, uh, it was never interesting for me to be... Uh, to belong to the mass, to to uh, to a large group of person, I was always very individual and maybe very special. Uh, Grasa Marshall once said, uh, when she said goodbye to me in Mozambique and Maputo mm -hmm. after having visited five-hour school, I wish there were more Peter Kramers on this world. And on the 8th of June this year, I said Gra she was there present. Uh, it was an um, an event uh, celebrated by the United Nations for the second millennium development goal. I said, Grasa, I don't think whether this is too desirable because I'm a very special person. So you're, you're, an, you're an individualist. What was interesting in that report, I saw there was that one scene where you're sitting in the African school and you're clapping your hands. You look unbelievably happy and unbelievably relaxed. Yeah. How long has the project been going for? Well, we started, in fact, in May 2005, okay. and so, so we are now in the sixth year. Yeah. And because of the success, we enlarged the project from first six countries to further five countries. So we are now building schools in 11 African states. Okay. So you, well, one second, you, you've been operating for five going on six years now. How, can you measure how successful this has been? Yes, uh, I can measure it in two aspects. First of all, we, in, we have now built or refurbished uh, around um, 800 schools. We've brought one million kids because one, of this. Is one million? One million because of this initiative to school. And we have improved the situation, the learning situation of further four million. Mm -hmm. So five million uh, kids in Africa are participating and benefiting from this project. Fundraising is not anymore of Schools for Africa a Peter Kramer project. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, we have now 24 NETCOMs, National Committees of UNICEF, in 24 countries who are collecting money. It's, uh, it's big money from companies like um, IKEA or Madonna, mm -hmm. who, who had made a concert, uh, or Gucci. It's, uh, most money is coming from small donators and we have uh, reached the 100 million US dollar mark, uh, I think, uh, last month or the months before. So uh, I think we are on the right track. But Schools for Africa is more than fundraising. Schools for Africa is a political voice for the implementation of the second millennium development goal, because even if we build or manage to build 5,000 schools, which is a very ambitious goal. Next year, we celebrate the first 1,000 school, uh, but 80,000 schools are missing. So who is paying and building the other 75,000 uh, 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 schools? So it is our approach uh, to talk to the governments mm -hmm. of the rich countries, to talk to the United Nations, to really fulfill their promise. They signed in August 2000 the Millennium Development Goals and the first one is to halve the poverty worldwide and the second one is to bring all children in the world to school until the year 2015. And, and you I'm... want them to meet their commitments? Exactly. Exactly. Okay, we're going to move on just a little bit because I know that one thing that uh, Peter Kramer is also concerned about is that uh, what people see here in Germany is a growing divide between rich and poor here in Germany. We're going to talk about that, but let's, one thing we have to bear in mind is that Germany is a very rich country compared to Africa, for example. Now, the latest figures show that over 11 million households are worth more than a million euros and that there are some 430,000 millionaires here in Germany. Now, the question for Peter Kramer is, are they paying enough tax? And the answer for Peter Kramer is no. <laughs> Uh, Peter Kramer, you are a well-off person. Are you paying much less tax than you were paying 10 years ago? I don't think so. Uh -huh. we, we, have, we have, first of all, we have now the tonnage tax, mm -hmm. where you... No, talking about, I'm talking about you as a person, you as an individual. Are you paying less income tax than you yes, were? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Of course. Uh, the, 
the uh, the taxes um, in the high progression have decreased from from 53 percent under yeah. coal now to 42 plus the three percent for millionaires to 45. Okay, and you are unhappy percent. about that, and you have put your money where well, your mouth. Well, I think that uh, the the question of uh, tax is not uh, so much a question of increasing the income tax. Mm -hmm. It's more the the uh, the question of wealth tax, of inheritance tax, yeah. of uh, Vermögensteuer, yeah. um, wealth, wealth tax, tax yeah. wealth mm -hmm. tax, etc. If we go there, not to British level, not yeah. to French level, yeah. not to American level, not to J Japan level, who are paying four to five times more uh, taxes uh, re related to to the BHP, but just to the European average level, we get 20 billion euros more taxes. OK, so that's what you're calling for. You're a very unusual person because you are a wealthy person who is calling for that. We saw another example in that report. What do your, uh, what do your friends in wealthy Hamburg say about all this? Well, this is very, very typical. People are not talking with me about it. They are speaking about me. Uh, behind that, your back? Uh, behind my back or oh. with their friends or and I'm hearing th through third parties what they are thinking. They are not very ha happy about it. They, they are respecting me. They are respecting me very, very much for my engagement in Africa. What I'm doing there, not just for half a year, but for six years now. Uh, but uh, if I uh, go to my tax points, there are only few millionaires in Germany who are, who are joining me. But even them, I mean, uh, the, uh, the leader of the uh, Mittelstandsvereinigung of the Christian Democratic Party okay. has, has asked for higher taxes. So I'm not alone in this. OK, so a key figure in the Conservatives is also being calling for higher taxes, like Peter Kramer. <laughs> OK, we've got to explain one thing for our viewers at home, that Hamburg is a port, but it's an inland port. It's not actually on the coast. No, it's joined to the coast by the River Elbe. How far is it from the coast? I think it's around 120 kilometres okay. away. So a large distance. And, and the, the bit of the River Elbe that goes into Hamburg, ship owners like you, they want to make it a metre deeper, yeah? Yeah. Why? Why, some... what, why does that make a difference? I don't understand that. A metre is nothing. Uh, well, uh, First of all, um, I'm personally not benefiting at all okay. from it because uh, it is related to the large container ships. It's the container people, uh, isn't it? uh, Which I don't have and yeah. will not have. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the large container lines will and cannot anymore enter into the Hamburg port if we don't deepen the River Elbe. And it's necessary. If you go there with a 13,000 TU uh, ship uh, um, to Hamburg, you need to deepen the Elbe if the vessel is fully loaded. And if we don't do it, uh, then the ships will go to Rotterdam or, mm. or, or to Cuxhaven, okay. and then Hamburg will lose a large share. But you're a lefty, that's what we've learnt in the programme. You're somebody who pr probably has sympathy for these environmental concerns. I have sympathy, but, uh, well, first of all, I don't uh, see that the um, environment will be harmed so much by this metre. Uh, uh, you know, I'm... I'm uh, you're relatively very, optimistic. Very, very often mm -hmm. uh, I'm in favour of... Uh, 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 Jesus and subjects of the Green Party, but at this point, not. OK. Give me... Uh, you've mentioned the, you know, the rivals. The great rival for Hamburg is obviously Rotterdam. Hamburg is a huge port. It's a magnificent port city. Does Hamburg, yes or no, have a rosy future? Yes, definitely a rosy future, because Hamburg is uh, not only mentally what is called the port of the world, mm -hmm. it's also in a very, very uh, commercial way, the port to Scandinavia. Uh, and that is very, very, very important for Hamburg. OK, a rosy future for Hamburg. <laughs> Peter Kramer, that report on Marx's law in the west of Germany, it shows two sides of Germany. It shows a run-down, multi-ethnic community on the one hand, perhaps. On the other hand, it shows people also from the immigrant community who have a lot of uh, energy and are real entrepreneurs. Which is the real Germany? 
Well, Germany is for sure a multinational country and without the foreigners, we could close down nearly everything. The industry, the science, uh, the fruit shops, where you have a lot of Turkish uh, producers, the taxi drivers, half, mm. half of the taxi drivers, n not only in Hamburg, I think also here in Berlin, are mm -hmm. foreigners. Uh, so the foreigners are belonging to our society. They have, of course, to learn uh, German, that's mm -hmm. very, very important. Mm -hmm. But that is not only their fault, fault if they haven't learned uh, German, it's also the fault of the policy for years and years not to teach uh, German in a sufficient way. Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, that is very clear, they have to respect um, our laws, like foreigners have to respect uh, the laws in Great Britain if they live in London. Or okay. We're getting close to the end. I'd just like to go, to go back to your hometown to wrap up. We've been looking at Marks Law here. Uh, let's go back to Hamburg. Hamburg is a, is a very international city. It's a port city. It's got a very multi-ethnic community. Does that lead to tensions in Hamburg? There, you know, so there has been a tendency in Germany in recent months to act as though it's, it's the migrants are a problem. It's, what's, it's, what's the situation in Hamburg? It's quite interesting. I'm very, very or quite close. Uh, to one gymnasium in Hamburg, it is the gymnasium Hamm, okay. so-called so a, a grammar school. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it is a high school, uh, yeah. and uh, there are kids from 45 countries mm -hmm. with 63 languages. Everything is very, very peaceful, and uh, it doesn't matter whether you are a German or whether uh, you come from. China or, or from South Africa, the people are living there very, very peaceful together and are learning together uh, German or physics or whatever. And on that very positive note, we're going to turn to the Talking Germany quiz at the end of the show, because that was a very, uh, it was, that was interesting. That's a, that's a real positive take on the, the whole issue of uh, integration here in Germany. Let's move on to the quiz. I give you two choices. Yeah. yeah. Money is a problem or money is a solution? Money gives opportunities. <laughs> Good. What works better, protest or persuasion? Protest can be persuasion. <laughs> Hamburg is a multicultural city or a German city? Hamburg is a multicultural city, the most beautiful of Germany. That's a good place to stop as well. We've been talking to uh, the millionaire rebel, if you like, Peter Kramer. Me and Peter are now going to go off and put our rebel T-shirts on, take our suits off. There's plenty to choose from. Uh, James Dean, Che Guevara, Bob Marley. Here we go. We're off. Yep. Bye-bye. Come back next week. Tschüss. <laughs>